Welcome to Texas. <laughs> Four years ago, when I moved to Austin, the first question I asked my coworkers was, where can I get some beef ribs? My coworker asked me back, what kind of beef ribs? You mean the traditional beef ribs or the Texas beef ribs? I am in Texas. Of course, let's go to the Texas version. So we went to a restaurant close to downtown. The name was Terry Black's. Originally, I thought beef ribs should be about this size, and I can probably finish one slack. I was too naive. This is actually what I got. <laughs> I couldn't even finish one. As you all know, everything is bigger in Texas, and we keep them weird in Austin. But beef ribs, but Texas beef ribs, is not just bigger or weird. It's better. It is juicy and has more flavors. So is probabilistic classification. <laughs> <laughs> when people talk about the classification, usually people refer to the traditional classification, you know, with a label output. Zero or one, hot dog, not hot dog, Texas barbecue, not Texas barbecue. But a lot of the time, people are more interested to know the chance of an observation belong to a class rather than just knowing the uh, most likely class. For example, in weather forecasting, knowing the chance of raining tomorrow probably is more valuable than just to know the prediction whether it will rain or not. So the traditional classification problem becomes a probabilistic classification problem. Let's do a project together here. So the task here is to predict credit card default uh, probabilities. The data we have has uh, 30,000 records with 24 columns, which means one target and 23 variables. The average default rate on this data set is 0.2212. Let's pretend that this is the reality, although it is not true, otherwise the bank has already gone bankrupt with such a higher default rate. This assumption is critical in probabilistic classification because if the assumption is violated, your prediction will be biased because your model is trained on biased data. But here, let's just pretend that, that much is the reality. So, as traditional machine learning approach, we firstly load the data, do some cleaning and transformation, split the data into training data set and test the data set. We load the algorithm from scikit-learn, since it's a SciPy conference, uh, we are not our user here, right? <laughs> so we train the model uh, on our training data set to get our final model. We use our model to predict the test data set. To get the uh, forecasted probabilities, we probably use a function called a predict prob. Suppose we only compare two models here, logistic regression and the naive base model. These are the two distributions from the output of these two models. The red one is a logistic regression and the green one is a naive base. They are quite different. Logistic regression doesn't have a single prediction higher than 0 0.5, and the naive base pushes, tries to push all the probabilities to the two ends. So the question is, which model is better? Anyone thinks it's a logistic regression? Hands up. How about a naive base model? Thank you. This is a tricky question. We need a matrix to measure the, the focus of the probabilities to compare the model performance. Let's first try the most popular one, the AUC score, uh, which is used the most popular in, in traditional classification problems. So here, here is our RC curve. If we calculate the AUC score, the naive base AUC score is 0 0.657 and the logistic regression AOC score is 0 0.633. Looks like naive base is better, is it? If we look at the two charts closely, 
you notice the difference between the two AUC score is not as big as the difference between the two distributions. It looks like there's a puzzle piece missing. To figure out which puzzle piece is missing, let's take a look at where is the RC curve from and how is the AOC score calculated? First of all, two terminologies, true positive rate and false positive rate. If we define a threshold among our forecasted probabilities, let's say 0 0.8, we classify all the observations has higher forecast probability than 0 0.8 as class one. The rest of them below 0 0.8 as class zero. The true positive rate is the total number of correctly classified as one divided by the total positives in your data set. And the false positive rate is the total number of falsely classified as one divided by the total negatives on your data set. Now to draw the RC curve, firstly, we need to concatenate our forecasted probabilities with the actual outcomes, zero or one, into one table and rank them by uh, from the highest probability, highest forecasted probability to the lowest forecasted probability. <laughs> now imagine we have a cursor at the top, moving towards to the bottom, step by step. Each step, we define a threshold and calculate the true positive rate and false positive rate. At the end, we plot our true positive rate as y-axis and the false positive rate as x-axis, that is our RC curve. Let's take a look at an animation. So the left side is a ranked list. Every time when the cursor meets a positive, it moves one step up. If it's a negative, it moves one step to the right. Once we have the RC curve, the AOC score is just to simply calculate the area under this curve. If we look back on, uh, if you look back up on the whole process, we didn't use the probabilities to calculate our AUC score. The probabilities were, were only used to rank the list. That means the AUC score doesn't care about the probabilities. It only cares about the ranking. AUC score has another name called C statistics. It is a probability. It measures if you randomly pick one positive observation and one negative observation, the chance the positive one has a higher forecast probability than the negative one. Again, it doesn't care about the probability. It only cares about the ranking. That is the reason AUC score is not a good metric in probabilistic classification problems. Now let's take a step back. Think about what is probability? What is a good probability? Probability itself is a measurement. It measures the confidence of your prediction. If I predict the raining chance for the next 10 days, each day as chance 0 0.8, if it turns out only two out of the 10 days are actual rain, that means my, pro my focus probability is not good. I am overconfident. Only if eight out of the 10 days actual rain, that means my focus is good, my prediction is good. We can apply the same technique here. So we split our forecasted probabilities into 10 buckets. In each bucket, we calculate our average forecasted probability and the uh, average observed probability, which is just the fraction of the positives in the bucket. And we plot, then we plot the observed, the average observed probability as y-axis and the average forecasted probability as x-axis to get our calibration plot. If our points are all on the diagonal, that means they are perfectly calibrated. If the points in the uh, top left dome, that means 
the, probability, uh, the forecasted probabilities are too small. We are underconfident. If the, pro if the points are here, that means our probabilities are too big. We are overconfident. From this chart, uh, we can see the logistic regression seems better than naive base because most of the points are close to the diagonal. There is only one point of the diagonal. This is probably because it has small, uh, small samples here. But the naive base is kind of like completely off the diagonal. So does that mean logistic regression is a better model? Before we jump to the conclusion, let's get back to our calibration plot to finalize our matrix. Here, instead of bucketing the data into 10 buckets, we bucket them by unique, uh, unique predictions. That means each unique probability as one bucket. We calculate the same average forecasted probability and the average observed probability of each unique probability. Focus of each unique forecasted probability. Here is a one uh, unique prediction. So from the last slide, we learned this point needs to be close to the diagonal. So we have our first metric. It's called a reliability. It has another name, calibration. It measures how close your prediction, your probability to the reality. Now if we only care about the reliability matrix, we'll end up only have one prediction fits all observation. That's our ground truth. Because it, it guarantees the only one unique prediction view on the diagonal. So we need the, this bucket bucket to be away from our ground truth. Now we have our second metric. It's called a resolution. It measures the purity of your unique predictions. Lastly, we add a, a term called uncertainty. It, is me it measures the noise level of your data. Now we have all of our matrix. Let's put them together. We got our Bryce score. Bryce score is equal to the reliability minus the resolution plus the uncertainty. Now this equation may look complex. Fortunately, we can mathematically add them together to get our final term. Now it's clear, the Bryce score is a mean square loss. Now let's use Bryce score to calculate our model performance. Because Bryce score is a loss function, so small number is better. Logistic regression now is significantly better than naive base because it has a much smaller Bryce score. But hold on the celebration on logistic regression for those supporters. Let's take a look at the details. The, um, the contributions from each component of a Bryce score. Again, price score equal to reliability minus resolution plus uncertainty. Because uncertainty measures the noise level of the data, it has nothing to do with your model. So they have the same uncertainty score. It's not a surprise. And for the resolution, the maximum resolution score will be the uncertainty. And both of the models did a great job. They maxed out the resolution. Now it only leaves the reliability term, which logistic regression is significantly better than naive base model, which matches what we see from the calibration plot. Now think about if we can find a transformation function to map those points to the diagonal we can significantly improve our reliability of the naive base and potentially get a better Bryce score than logistic regression. There are several algorithms can do this work. Um, here, let's try the three popular ones. The first one is called plot scaling. 
it fits a sigmoid function on top of your forecasted probabilities. And the sigmoid function is just a logistic regression. It's a parametric method. The second one is called the isotonic regression. It fits a piecewise constant on top of your uh, forecasted probabilities. The last one is called the spline. It fits a cubic smooth function on your f uh, predictions. Both of the isotonic regression and the spline are non parametric methods, which means they are more powerful, they have more freedom, but also easy to overfit. Fortunately, our data set is big enough to avoid the overfitting issue. Let's take a look at the result after the calibration. So again, the green one is the original naive base model. This red one is the logistic regression. If you look at the price score, all of the three calibration algorithms significantly improved the logistic regression, uh, sorry, the naive base model. The best one, the isotonic regression, provides the bright score equal to 0 0.157. It's even better than the register regression. So the final winner is naive base with isotonic regression calibration. Let's take a look at the details. The uncertainty, remember, it measures the data, nothing to do with your algorithms. So the score doesn't change. And the isotonic regression, interestingly, it sacrifices sacrifice a lot of the resolution score to get a, a much better reliability score and eventually achieve the best bright score. Let's take a look at the, at the comparison before and after. The green one is the distribution from the original naive base model, and the purple-ish distribution are the, uh, are the calibrated after the uh, isotonic, regre isotonic regression. And it successfully moved the, the probabilities from the two ends to somewhere close to the ground truth. The green one is the original mean of, the, of our probabilities. And now it's here. It's almost overlap with the ground truth. And if you look at the RC curve, the AOC score barely changed. Because the calibration only improves your reliability. It won't affect your model's power to distinguish the positives from the negatives. I think I heard some voices saying it, it is not a an fair uh, it is not a fair comparison because we didn't calibrate our logistic regression. Now let's guess if we apply our three uh, calibration algorithms on top of a logistic regression output, what will happen? Three, two, one. Okay, let's take a look at the result. the bright score barely changed, although the distribution shift around a little bit. Why? If you look at the loss function of the logistic regression, during the model training, the logistic regression is trying to minimize the forecasted probability to uh, from the, the actual outcome. So if your logistic regression is converged, it guarantees it will provide the lowest bright score. So that's a, that is the reason the calibration on logistic regression doesn't improve the bright score. However, the naive base model has a different story. The name is naive base because it has a very naive assumption called the conditional independence. This assumption makes the, uh, makes the model simpler and faster. However, because this assumption is always violated in reality, when you estimate the focus, uh, estimate the probabilities, it will double count the evidence to push the probabilities to the two ends. 
Think about presidential election. How many people were so sure their candidate would win but turned out lost? Probably half of the Americans, right? <laughs> if you ask them the question before the final election that, um, what do you think the winning chances your, uh, your candidate has? They'll probably answer something like, uh, well, <clears throat> conservatively speaking, I would say it's about 80% chance. But in reality, we all know the winning chance between the two final candidates from the two parties will always close to half to half, close to 0 0.5. Why people were so overconfident? Because we, as human beings, usually unconsciously have the same assumption as the naive base model. People thought the opinions they received from their families, friends, co-workers, classmates were independent. Unfortunately, they are the same. Because the people around them probably work for the same company, go to the same church, or even eat the same barbecue. People all share the similar mindset, um, share the same mindset with us, around us. That is the reason we need to listen to more different voices in our life to understand the world better. Thank you very much. My name is Gordon. I'm a data scientist. Uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, I'll run the mic over if you want to throw up a hand. You can ask questions about the barbecue. <laughs> Does this work with other classifiers, or is it basically working because it fixes the unreasonable assumptions of naive bays? Um, this is a very good question. So he asks if the uh, calibration algorithm applies for all the classifications or just uh, the naive base, right? Actually, it's, uh, you, can use, uh, you can apply for all the classification algorithms. And most of the algorithm, classification algorithms have the similar problems as naive base. Naive base model tries to push the probabilities to the two ends because of the uh, conditional independence assumption. And other algorithms, for example, uh, the boosting trees, uh, like um, all those are ensemble models, they try to push probabilities close to the, to the middle. Because they are kind of like, you know, voting, it's hard to get the, uh, like, uh, exact zero or one. And for, for support vector machine, it is not measure, the, uh, it, it, it provides the distance instead of the probabilities. So most of the algorithm, uh, as far as I know, logistic regression probability is, is the only one you don't need to calibrate. And that is the reason in, in cargo competition, uh, a lot of the stacking models, ensemble models, at the end, they use the logistic regression to, to uh, to fit, uh, fit a logistic regression on top of the forecast probability from different models, because you also, they also want to uh, calibrate the probabilities. Thank you. I wanted to clarify a little bit the use of isotonic regression there in your in fixing in the calibration part. So for isotonic regression, you need to have you know, the prediction, the, the labels, and they need to be ordered in a particular way. So the ordering that was done here was based on the features of this 24 columns in the data set? Thank you. Uh, just so, sorry. Uh, so the question is, uh, how does the isotonic uh, regression work here, is, uh, especially the labeling and the ranking? And my answer is very simple. Cyclin takes care of all the work. <laughs> So here, uh, because I used, uh, I didn't use the pure isotonic regression. I used the, I think it, it, the name is isotonic uh, classify CV from Scikit Learn, and it applies uh, cross validation as well. That is the reason uh, when I show in the RC curve, it shifts a little bit because of the cross validation.
So what, what does the target look like? Does it have to be like a probability or it can be binary or you know, what if it's a multi-class uh, classification problem? Uh, sorry, can you say that again? Uh, so, so basically when you try to uh, compute the score, you need a target or ground truth, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, what mm -hmm. is that ground truth? It's the probability or it's a binary, it's a basically integers or it's a probability. So for the probabilistic classification, uh, the target is a label. And here in my example, it's a simplest, uh, the simple like binary version, but it also applied to the multi-classification multi problems. And for the uh, calibration algorithms, the target uh, is the probabilities, your forecasted probabilities. So the, the calibration algorithm, they fit on top of your original model output not uh, fit on the data directly. Thank you. All right, if there are no further questions, let's thank Gordon again. Thank you.